Who thinks Molly should do decaf the rest of the day? Would you just raise your hand? All right, we're going decaf, Molly. We're going decaf. So in your notes, we're going to jump right into it. I want you to write down in big letters at the very top of page one. You've got three pages for this session, and you'll use them all. But I want you to write down the word honor. The word honor means to esteem as highly valuable. And when we esteem people as highly valuable, this is the key. We're recognizing their worth. We're not determining their worth. Their worth is already set. Their worth is set because of the imago Dei, the image of God in man. Do you understand the image of God in each one of us in here? Because you're created in the image of God, it gives you automatic intrinsic value. That's why you're valuable. It's always important when we talk about this to talk about the difference between having the image of God and being a child of God. You become a child of God by placing faith in Jesus Christ, faith alone in Christ alone. But the image of God is in all men. And, and I was recently in Minnesota talking about the Imago Dei. A church asked me to speak on it, and I was speaking on the value that we all have. And I said, this, is, this drives me and everything I see on TV, all that's going on politically. And I was, I was talking about, and this connects us to what we talked about last night with listening. I made this one comment. I was talking about the, that I believe that every child in the womb has the image of God. That's why they're valuable. I went through that. And then I got to immigrants and I said, every immigrant who crosses our southern border, whether legally or illegally, is created in the image of God and has automatic intrinsic value. And it sucked the life out of the room, just like the NFL take the knee illustration. And afterwards, somebody came up to me and said, I can't believe that you stood in our church and discussed that you're for open borders. I want to ask you again, did I state that I'm for open borders? I stated that a person is valuable. But it's interesting, we're just not hearing it. People are valuable. And this goes way, and, and I'm not making a statement about immigration, I'm making a statement about people and honoring people. And here's why this is important. Some of you feel like you have very low value right now. Some of you feel because someone said something to you or did something to you and it makes you feel worthless. Nothing I say can add value to you. Nothing I say can take value away from you. Nothing I do can add value to you. Nothing I do can take value away from you because you're created in the image of God. Automatic, intrinsic value. How are we doing esteeming people as highly valuable? One of the greatest tools that was ever given to me in speaking about honor was by my mentor, Dr. Gary Smalley. He keeps an honor list and kept one. He went home to be with the Lord about four years ago. But he keeps an honor list throughout his whole life for all the people in his life who are important to him. And he, and he would always tell me, remember, this is just recognizing their value. They're already valuable. I just want to see and recognize it because in counseling we call this confirmation bias. Confirmation bias says you make a decision and then you look for the evidence to back it up. And he said, when you keep a list of all the reasons why people are valuable, you're recognizing their worth, not setting it, but you're recognizing their worth. It changes how you look at them every time you look at them. And I, I just want to encourage you, maybe leave a little bit of room underneath as we go on to more content, but as you leave a little bit of room underneath that word honor and the definition of it. And take some time today to write an honor list for someone you're sitting next to right now. Maybe a parent. I do this with my parents. I don't give my mom and dad anniversary cards or birthday cards anymore. I give them honor list. I remember the first time I did it, it was my mom's 64th birthday. And I asked everybody in our family, hey, write, a reason, write all the reasons why Pomabani is highly valuable. And I said, and when we go out to dinner this week, her birthday's actually in a couple weeks, we need to do this again. I said, I want, and we're going to pull these lists out, and we're just going to read it. Just pulling the list out at my mom's dinner, she went, mm, mm, you know, I hate it when you do this. Just the thought of being honored brought my mom to tears. I did this. My parents just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, honoring them. And, and let me tell you, your mom and dad, they don't want any more cards, right? I'm looking at some senior adults. You don't want no more gifts. We're at the place where now when your kids leave your house, they leave with boxes of stuff, don't they? They're just, you're tired of stuff. But they're never tired of honor. I do this with Amy's parents, and I love the spam thing. Amy's great-grandpa worked at Hormel for 47 years. 
Her grandfather worked there for 42 years, and her dad worked there for 32 years. I married into Spam. That's what I tell people. I, that's how I... Have you been to the Spam Museum? Raise your hand if you've been to... Look at all the Spam... There's a museum. After you start cooking with it, you can go visit how it's made. It's, it's riveting. Uh, <laughs> been there more than once. <laughs> so, but honor, just esteeming is highly valuable, and... I remember the first time I saw one of Gary's honor lists. It was for his wife, Norman. I walked into his office. It was four pages sitting on his desk, and it just said all the reasons why Norma Smalley is highly valuable. I go, Gary, what do you do with that? He said, well, after we get into conflict, I like to come in here and pull this list out and be reminded of all of Norma's value. And he said the goal after a conflict is not to pull out the honor list and be like, yeah. The goal is not editing. The goal is reminding. And he said, Ted, get your list started for Amy. This is my list for Amy, why I love Amy, what is valuable about Amy. I'm just going to read a couple of them for you so you can get started. I want you to do this for your parents. I want you to do this for your children, your grandchildren. I want you to do it for uh, housemates. I want you to just connect with people, sharing value, their value with them. Here's number one on my list. Amy, I love your all or nothing passion. You do nothing halfway. When you start a project, you finish it with gusto. You inspire me to work hard and get it done. And my wife is a passionate woman. We can be driving down the road and go, like, I don't know what just happened right there. That is just passion coming out of her. Everything we do is like this. She's nothing. She's calm about nothing. And we walk through our neighborhood, and we don't stroll through the neighborhood. We're getting through our neighbor. We're getting our steps in. She'll ask me, are you squeezing your cheeks together? Let's get this thing going. And I'll be like, Amy, come on. I can come home from a bad day at church and be like, you know, it's kind of a rough day at church, and she's fine. Let's quit, move to Africa, be missionaries full time. Wow. That that escalated real fast. I think we should bring it down a notch, pray about it before we go moving continents. I love your disdain for directions. You love letting me lead. You couldn't care less how we're getting there. While driving or at airports, you pay no attention to signs because you completely trust me getting us there. I love your silent, patriotic laugh. This is so much fun. My wife, when she finds something funny, this is her laugh. (laughs) Nothing comes out. Just hand over the heart, lean forward. And I tell her, babe, you got to let that, just like some of you have been wanting to laugh this week, you got to let that laughter out. You hold laughter in, ladies, it turns to cellulite. I need you to let that (laughs) laughter, just let that laughter go. I love your attention to detail. You leave no stone unturned when it comes to doing things right, from planning our vacations to making dinner reservations. You know what time of day we will be hungry three months from now. <laughs> I love your lists that keep our family organized. And I love it. She get, when I call it her mom mode. When Man, she's just getting ready to leave the house and everybody's getting ready. And she'll ask me leaving the house, hey, babe, you need to go potty. We're going to be gone for a little while. And I'll be like, you know, I'm 46 and a half. <laughs> when I got to go potty, I'll go all by myself, okay? I don't, I don't need any help. I love the fact that you do not have a people-pleasing gene. You do not strive to meet the nonstop and at times excessive expectations that people place on you. You model a great marriage for our kids. I love how you love our son, and then I give her several, and some of this is personal, more private. I love how you love Corinne, uh, and I wish I'd give you the whole list, but some of my favorites. I put stars next to a few of them. I love your spontaneity. With two to three days notice, you can cut loose and go with the flow. My favorite line is when you tell me, just call me Flo. And she knows when she's being rigid and planning, and, and uh, I just learned it from Kendra. Where's Kendra? Where's Kendra? Fantastic job today, Kendra, teaching. I'm, I'm going to take a picture of you and send it to Jeremy Kubitschek. Uh, but she's the one on a road trip. She's like, we, we've already, we don't even need to go. We've already been there. You know, I planned it all in my mind. It was an awesome trip in my mind. We're good, you know. But I love it. I love your equilibrium. You know when the house is 70.5 degrees. And I love when you ask me, did you change the thermostat? My answer is always the same. I haven't touched the thermostat in the past 21 years. (laughs) But I love it when you kick off the bottom corner of the sheets to expose your left foot. Does anybody do that? It's like I just got hot, but oh, there they go. I'm good now. And then all night long, her foot's going from inside to outside uh, the covers. (laughs) I just don't understand it. But with her, I love how you protect me around hot things. That's one of my favorite things about her. I'll walk into the bedroom go into the master bathroom, and as I'm walking by, I'm five feet from the curling iron. She'll go, hey, watch out, the curling iron's hot. I'm like, babe, when's the last time I came in here and went, 
ha, I, I'm just not going to do it, but I love that you're guarding us at all times as a family. Uh, I want to talk about how honor continues in a relationship, and I, really, I hope that this is for those of you who may be drift, drifting in a relationship right now, that you can find your way back to deep levels of intimacy, that you can experience uh, that vulnerability plus safety that we talked about last night. For those of you who have been hurt by a relationship, I'm hoping that this session is an opportunity for you to maybe figure out why, to, to understand what really happened and what was going on in your heart. But I hope we end as we started, that you would understand how valuable you are, that you would understand that you're created in the image of God, that you would understand that you are loved by God, and that you would understand what's going on in the heart. And here's the thing. Some of you, as we talk about relationships and as we talk about the fear cycle, the fear dance in particular, moving from anger to intimacy, uh, that you would not feed your regrets, but that you would ask Jesus to redeem your remaining days. That's my prayer for this session. That's what I was praying sitting right down there. That you wouldn't feed your regrets, but you would ask Jesus to redeem your remaining days. And so I want to move us from anger to intimacy have a little bit of fun here at the beginning. I wanted this, this post I, I found about a year ago fits my personality to a T. And I want you to raise your hand if this fits your personality as well. Let me turn it on. Someone just honked to get me out of my parking space faster. So now I have to sit here until both of us are dead. <laughs> How many of you, that's you right there? Yeah, you don't push me. And this whole session... Okay, is about when people push your buttons. If, if, and let me just ask the married couples in here. You know your spouse's buttons. Like, you know all of them. Would you raise your hand? Let me just see your hands. Okay. Now, do you tend to care for those buttons? Or do you tend to know just right the when the moment? It was all right there. All right, I knew it. That was a vulnerable moment right there. And I'm going to push it just because it felt good. Raise your hand if you've done that. Yes, we've all done that. And so things can get lost in translation. So I want to kick off with is apologies. Because we talked about it last night, the difference uh, between listening and talking, but now the difference between what you say and what people actually hear. What you say and what people hear. Because what people hear and what the other person in a relationship hears is more important to me than what I'm saying. And I want to go back and forth with what I call drive-through listening. Where I'll keep repeating the order until I get it right. Remember those old days with the big silver boxes? drive throughs have gotten a lot better. But you used to say, I'll take a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. That'll be a chicken sandwich, onion rings, and a shake. No. And you would go back and forth, back and forth. I want to I go back and forth in the relationship. You matter enough to me. I honor you enough that I want to go back and forth so what I'm saying intending to get across, and what you're hearing matches. So, for example, here a mom was trying to learn how to do all this texting. And so she texted her son, what does I-D-K-L-Y and T-T-Y-L mean? And her son texted back, I don't know, love you, talk to you later. <laughs> to which mom said, okay, I'll ask your sister. That's what we're saying, not being understood and received. So here's what, we're going to have a little fun with this, and this is a good enough group, it's a little bit on the big side to do this, but I want you to, with a strong voice, I'm going to state an apology, but I want you to yell up what you hear, because you've heard these apologies before. You've heard these, and I put all of these in the, the bad apology category. Here's the first one. I'm sorry you feel that way. It's your fault. I'm not actually sorry. You're wrong about your feelings. Thank you. This is what, and here's what I think we're saying. You shouldn't feel that way. And, and, and let me tell you, you only ever need to apologize for what you say and do. You understand that. We never need to apologize for the feelings of other people. I own my feelings 100%, Amy owns them zero, and Amy owns her feelings 100% and zero. And here, we're really confused, I think, in the church today about feelings because I think we're teaching people how to stuff their emotions, how not to think about it. And you hear people say it all the time. 
Emotions are unreliable. Don't listen to them. It's not really a great way to look at emotions. Emotions are like your children. Please hear this. They're like your children. You should listen to them. You should care for them. But you should not allow them to make major decisions for your family. That's a better way to understand emotions. Emotions are not a right or wrong issue. We get focused on that too much. But listen to them. Care for them. Because... And Bob even mentioned it yesterday in his breakout that the primary emotions that we're going to be talking about in a second, we also call them core fears, we call them buttons, but those primary emotions are what lead to the secondary emotion of anger. I want to listen to and care for my emotions so it doesn't lead to unresolved anger. Let's do another apology. If I offended you, I'm sorry. What am I saying? What? What? You took it the wrong way. You're too sensitive. How about this one? I'm sorry you took it that way. You took it wrong. I think what I'm saying is you read more into that than I actually intended. I love this one. I'm sorry I said it that way. Again, do you see these are all terrible apologies. I think what we're saying here is what I told you was the truth and you needed to hear it. Okay. However... Maybe, probably, I could have said that a little bit better. I, I think that these are three of the hardest things to say. Three of the hardest things to say. Number one, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And then fill in behind that what you said or what you did. I think the second hardest thing to say, and I don't know if these are in any particular order, but I think all three are hard to say, I was wrong. Please forgive me. And the third hardest thing to say, Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> That's a pretty hard thing to say as well. So what I want to go into, and, and for time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into it, but I'm really covering what Gary and I poured our hearts and souls into as we looked at all different relationships in the church, in the family, in marriage, uh, in parenting, in this book uh, we wrote over 10 years ago called From Anger to Intimacy. And uh, it was really the story uh, of how I met Gary. Uh, I was at a church, uh, it's almost 19 years ago now, and I went there as a senior pastor at 26 years old, right out of seminary. So let's just say I had it all figured out. You know what I'm talking about. I was ready to go. This church uh, was running about 400 people. Uh, They had just practiced church discipline on a gentleman and it, it did not go well. He ended up losing his business in the town. He sued the pastor and the other pastors at the church and won a financial judgment against the church. So they were, then the senior pastor left. They hired me. And at 26, I truly believed I'm going to go in and fix all this mess. And let me tell you, I walked into a mess. And I walked in much like the personality you see up here. This is who I am all the time, and I went in like, man, we're just going to have fun. I was optimistic. I'm the connector, and I was ready to go, and about five months after being there, the staff pulled me aside and said, hey, we don't think you're the guy for the job, and uh, I, being the mature leader that I was at the time, I said, okay, you're all fired, and uh, the bylaws did not give me permission to do that, and so I just want to make this really clear to y'all. Before you go firing people, you really need to read those bylaws. Very important. You understand Uh, what's going on, and they said, no, you're not the guy, and they they say, you're too discipleship focused, we want somebody who's more evangelistic, and anyway, I could give you all, I'm not going to give you all the stories, but I I started to become a very angry guy, and they said, are you going to leave? I said, I don't feel I'm called to leave, and they said, well, then we're going to have to take you before the church for a vote, and so uh, now I'm about 27 at the time, they take me before the church, They have a meeting, and each staff member gets 20 minutes to explain to the church why I should be removed as a senior pastor. And uh, then we came back two weeks later for the vote, and uh, the vote was unsuccessful by two votes. And I was triggered a little bit this week watching the impeachment uh, uh, Senate thing. I turned it on to watch for a second. I'm like, I was right back there 19 years ago going, because there was only four vote difference. I had two votes. And uh, (laughs) to this day, I still don't know how my wife voted. Uh, in that meeting, <laughs> she was so ready to go, and I did. I, I, she just wanted to leave, but it was at that very time, in, the, in that two week period, that I met Gary Smalley. He called me and he said, Man, are you the talk of Southwest Missouri? 
I said, yeah, I, I know. He goes, can I meet you for breakfast? And I told Amy, we got to go. I mean, we use his text. We use his books as textbooks at Liberty University. And uh, so we went and sat down with him at Bob Evans. And it was there for the very first time in my life that someone started to picture a special future for me. And Gary said, tell me what's going on. I said, well, you know, next week they're taking me before the church for a vote. It's not going to be good. I don't know. It's, right now it doesn't, doesn't look good. Uh, Congress wants me out, but the Senate will probably keep me. Uh, no, that's, are you all okay with political humor? Can't we use a little political humor? Are we not there? So you're like, no, don't do it. I'm going to give you a political joke right now just so I can continue this story in good faith. All right? I just heard this one last week. Can I tell a political joke? Or how many say no? Raise your hand if you don't want me to tell a political joke. Okay. Don't put it on the evaluation. If you get mad, just deal with it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Guys, be, guys, day one on the Secret Service. Uh, it's his very first day on the job. He's walking the president out to the limo, and a gunman appears, and this new Secret Service agent yells, Mickey Mouse! Everybody's like, what? They apprehend the guy. They take care of all that. A couple hours later, they ask the guy, hey, um, what, what was that all about? Why did you yell Mickey Mouse? He said, I know, I got really nervous. I meant to yell, Donald Duck. <laughs> Come on. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, I know that joke's only going to work another five years, but I still think it's a good joke. <laughs> oh, is that, did I cross the line right there? Was that crossing the line? Okay, I'll step back up a little bit if you had to do it. Look at somebody went. All you Bernie people, bring it down a notch. Just bring it down a notch. I actually stopped by a Bernie rally the other day. I want to do ministry. There was a Bernie rally going on. I said, I'm going to stop and support that. I went to take him free lunches, but they were already expecting him. It didn't, it didn't really work. <laughs> oh, come on. Listen, I'm trying to cover both sides of the aisle here. This is my last time at Plymouth Covenant, so I'm just grateful be sharing. But, but this tone, and it, it, this was who Gary was the day I met him. My wife is sitting at Bob Evans next to me in tears. I'm ticked. Gary goes, tell me what's going on. I remember saying, well, one lady told me yesterday if I were alive during the days of Noah, I would have been locked on the outside of the ark. <laughs> Another guy told me I reminded him of the time that God hardened Pharaoh's heart because they just wanted me gone and I wouldn't leave. And Gary, here was his response to that. What else you got? And I go, I don't, and this, I'll never forget him saying this to me. Ted, have you fallen on the ground before your father in heaven and praised your father in heaven for what you're going through right now in your mid-20s? And I said, no. He said, yeah, you, you have to see that this is, a, God has big plans for you. This is him picturing a special future. He said, now this meeting next week, he said, what do you do with it? I said, well, I get 20 minutes as well, you know. And he said, do they allow non-members to come to those meetings? He so bad wanted to come to the meeting. I could see him sitting there with popcorn and a drink. <laughs> he was into it, and he said, what are you going to do? I said, oh, I'm going to give every reason why these staff members, da, da, da. And Gary then started to shake his head. And this is when he started to teach me about personal responsibility. He said, Ted, here's what I recommend we do is we sit down, you and I, with a yellow pad, and you write down every single thing you've done wrong since showing up to that church. And see, that was the problem. I had done nothing wrong. <laughs> Good, a few of you get that. I had done plenty wrong, but I was blinded, and I needed someone to step in and help me take personal responsibility. We wrote a list, and we got onto more than one page, and I'm like, Gary, you're starting to make some of this stuff up. It's like, I know, but doesn't it feel good just to confess, to own your part of it? To own your part of it. Bob, you said it yesterday. If it's 5% your fault in this situation, own that 5%. Apologize for that 5%. And I said, Gary, what do you want me to do with this? He said, after they have talked about you for 20 minutes and all the reasons why you need to be removed, each one of them, you stand up and you read this list one item at a time and you apologize for each and every one of them. And he said, Ted, because this goes much deeper than just this church, unresolved anger is like drinking poison, expecting the other person to get sick. And right now, Ted, you're drinking it by the gallons. He said, and, and you never bury anger dead, you always bury it alive. You have to get your anger resolved with this church. Gary wanted to put on the guest card at Woodland Hills Family Church where he served as an elder for 12 years. 
uh, the church in, in Branson. He, he wanted to put on the guest card, after you fill out your name and information and children and birth dates, he wanted a box that said, I have unresolved anger. That a guest to our church could tell us they have unresolved anger. I'm like, Gary, I, see, I think that's a little much to ask our guests to share that with us. But it was, his, it was his heart because he would stand up to our congregation all the time and say, hey, listen, if you're a guest here today and you're coming from another church and you're mad, we need you to go back and make every effort at peace. He said, the problem is you'll come here and you'll love this church, you'll love our pastor, you'll love our staff, but you're only going to do that for like 6, 12, 24, maybe 36 months because you never bury anger dead, you always bury it alive. And he said, Ted, I know the temptation is to leave this church, box up everything and go to the next place, but there is no magical transformation in the U-Haul between churches because you leave here and you get here and guess what? There's people. Different faces, different names, but it's still people. What are you going to do? And this is when he started to teach me the fear dance, which we cover clearly. I tell this whole story if you want to know all the details of it, but the fear dance. And I want you to think about someone you've been in conflict with. It can be a spouse. It can be an ex-spouse. It can be a parent. It can be a coworker. That person that you never were able to reconcile with, that person you're ever, never able to resolve an issue with, we're talking about resolution and reconciliation in this fear dance. Just you're stuck and there's an issue. And this, I, we get this in counseling all the time. We, we need to talk to you, Ted, we're having money problems. We need to talk to you, we're having sex problems. We're having in-law problems. We're having job problems. We're, and, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And I love after meeting with someone a couple of times for them to pause and go, hey, you know what I just realized? We've never talked about the issue we originally signed up for. You know why? Because the issue is rarely ever the issue. There's always something else going on. And so maybe on a fresh page in your notes, write down this fear dance. And I'm going to share it with you as Amy and I, as we put the most work into this in our marriage. But I have a fear dance going on with each of my children. I have a fear dance going on. And for those of you who are not married yet, um, we know from research, if you've never been married, you got about a 90% chance of walking down an aisle one day. If you can figure out your half of this before you get married, before you start dating, before you're engaged, oh, you're going to be miles down the road compared to a lot of relationships. So this is, this is the fear dance. And right in the center of it, I want you to put, what's the issue? What, with whoever you are in conflict with or in conflict with right now, if you're married and doing this as a couple, I just want you to put, what is your recurring script? And by script, we're talking about just like a movie actor picks up a script and starts reading lines. Every time that issue comes up that you want to be the eye roller on, like, oh, here it is again that you just put that in the center and, and watch this dance unfold around it. And I'll start with my heart. Again, I am 100% responsible for my heart. Amy is 0% responsible for my heart. And these are my buttons. You can also call them core fears. You can also call them primary emotions. These are the primary emotions in me that lead to anger if I don't deal with them. My, I'm only giving you three, but I probably have six. But these are like little atomic bombs going off inside of me. The first one is controlled. Uh, and a lot of men in here, I fit the gender stereotype. A lot of men in here will relate to my buttons. But I don't like to be controlled. I don't like to be told what to do. That's why men don't stop and ask for directions. It was Gary Smalley's favorite joke. Why does it take a million sperm to fertilize one egg? Because not one of them little suckers will stop and ask for directions on the way to the egg. I don't like to be told what to do. I don't like to be judged. This comes from the church I grew up in. I grew up in an independent, fundamental, premillennial, King James Version only Baptist church. And I was constantly being told, what you do determines God's love for you. And it was Philip Yancey that set me free in this years ago when he said, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. I don't like to be judged. I don't like when people assign motives to my actions and like little atomic bombs going off. I don't like to feel like a failure. I, I don't, I, I want to feel successful as a husband, as a father, as a pastor today. I mean, this is just a lot of men. Whatever we set out to do, I want to be successful in it. Here's the thing. You don't ever see my buttons though. This is what makes relationships tricky. It's what makes relationships difficult, especially if you're just getting to know someone, especially if you're just starting to date someone. Be prepared. You're not going to see the emotions, but you do see the reactions. 
And here are my reactions. I withdraw. In a conflict, there's two primary reactions, fight or flight. I am out of the room. How many of you are out of the room? Let me just see your hands. When conflict raises its ugly head, I actually like to stir it up a little bit and then get out of there as quickly as possible. <laughs> but this is why, and, and somebody asked me, I've had multiple people ask me about my position with Take the Knee, and I'm going to share it right now because I feel safe enough with you. So this is my position on it. Uh, and let's just leave it in this room and on the internet, okay? Just in this room and on the internet, okay? In our family, when the national anthem plays, we stand up, we take off our hats, we put our hands over our heart, and we actually sing along. So I am, I, and I've trained that in, in my children. This is how we respect the flag. I'm not a big boycotter. Because I think boycotting is similar to withdrawal. And I already know this is something I struggle with. Boycotting is saying, I'm not going to engage with you because you have a completely different opinion than me. I'm not going to engage with you because you're even being disrespectful to me. I want to be a person of influence. And I don't feel that happens. And, and I get it. I, I know people boycotting Starbucks and Disney and Nike and... The NFL and all that, I just, that, that's my opinion. I, I'm just sharing that, and hopefully all of us are able to know that there are differences of opinion, but I just still don't think that keeps me from listening to everyone and anyone and what they're dealing with. But I don't want to withdraw, knowing that's my tendency. I don't like to belittle, but that's what happens. When my buttons get pushed, I will belittle. I will, I will make sure you know what I'm doing is more important than what you're doing. And I'll even use in conversation the word little. Did you have that little meeting today that you were supposed to? I mean, that you'll find a belittler will do that. And then I used to think it was a spiritual gift. It is not. Sarcasm. That is not a spiritual gift. Sarcasm actually comes from the word that means the tearing of the flesh. And, but here, here's what, here, when my buttons get pushed, I go into all of these reactions. Here's what I want you to do if you're taking notes. From the top left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner, draw a line. And simply put on the other side of that line, 100 and 0. To remind yourself, everything on that side of the line, I am 100% responsible for. My apologies flow out of my reactions. I am sorry I left the room. I am sorry I put your meeting down. I'm sorry I made you feel like your day wasn't as important as mine. I'm sorry that I said that. See, that's what, I'm sorry I left the room. I'm sorry I stopped talking. I'm sorry I said. When I get sarcastic, whatever words come out of my mouth, hey, I'm sorry for that. Now, it's interesting in relationships, especially ones that have been cultivated over a long period of time, my reactions push my wife's buttons. Oh, and here they are. One of them's cut off. She feels disconnected, abandoned, and rejected. The opposite of mine. Amy likes to feel connected to at all times. It's why I've talked to her today already twice. Not that she's requested it. Not that she's like, does he love me? Does he care for me? I, so there are times I'm on the road with one of our kids, and I feel more connected to her than when I'm actually in Branson, and she's running around doing her thing, and I'm running around doing my thing. It's like emotional connection sometimes is even better when we're on the phone processing stuff. When we're together in the same time, sometimes in the same town, we take for granted that we're together. But Amy likes to be connected to at all times. And then she doesn't like to be abandoned. So think about that. I shut down my words, which is disconnecting from her. And then I leave the room. Now I've abandoned her. And my wife, she's a, I told you, she, right? she is a strong woman in just, just everything that she does. She comes after me. If I shut down the conversation, and the classic withdrawal statement is what? I don't want to talk about it anymore. Or I don't, did you just hit him on the arm? You're not allowed to do that right now. This is, we're talking about personal response. I'm sorry that I had to see that right now. Look at, he leans back and he gets a prize. What else we got in here from, <laughs> from, Molly's, <laughs> from Molly's garage? We are out. We are done. Molly's garage is out of business right there. Wait a second. Nope, that's just a cover. But I shut down, and Amy's like, no, he ain't leaving it. Come back here. And her nickname, this is the only time she uses a sarcastic nickname. And it actually is cute, and I kind of, but whenever she calls me marriage boy, <laughs> that's, her, that's her way of, of walking in a room going, according to you on page 104, 
uh, you need to get your butt back in the kitchen, buddy. And we need to finish this before the sun goes down. Hit the stop button, stop rewinding, choose no law. Anyway, she comes after me. When I feel her coming after me, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And what happens is when she feels disconnected from, and there's a lot of guys in here that need to understand this right now. Because you have, you, your confirmation bias may be she's a nag. Really, you think she's coming at me, she's attacking me because she's trying to control me. Listen, when Amy comes at me and her word count has increased, and I mean it's gone. Isn't that a much better way to say it, word count increased? And she's speaking faster, and she's moved from the average woman 250 words per minute, according to Dr. Brizendine at UCLA. A man speaks 125 words a minute. A woman speaks 250 words a minute. When she goes to about three, 400 words a minute, I used to think she's trying to control me. Nope. This will change everything about what you understand in communication and in relationship. She's not trying to control me. She's trying to connect with me. Because she is acting out of her primary buttons, her primary emotions. She is digging in. But when I feel controlled, that's when I go to sarcasm. I belittle her and I cut her. And that's the last one maybe you can't see. She feels rejected. We've come a long way from just disconnecting with her, shutting down my words, leaving the room, abandoning her, and now she comes in wanting to get this thing resolved, and now I start putting her down with my words. Now I've rejected her. But again, you don't see those emotions. You see her reactions. Her reactions are the opposite of mine. She doesn't withdraw. She doesn't, she doesn't even, she's never withdrawn in her life. She is escalation. Raise your hand if you're fight. It's okay. We're not, Yeah. And why? Because it's, it's silly to go another 24 hours of strain in this relationship. Look at her. She's like, yeah, you have, come here, marriage boy. <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's silly, it, and it doesn't make sense. The person with the fight, they're like, let's just deal with this. Why do we want to go to bed like this? No way. Let's just deal with it, get it over with right now. Exaggeration. This is when you use the term always and never. This is when you're... you're uh, you know, you can, I can take the trash out 96 out of 100 times. I'm not a math major, but that's, that's, that's an A. That's a 96 out of 100. That's a 96%. That's not an A minus. That's an A. That's a solid A. The four times I don't take it out, you never take out the trash. See, you're now taking, you're painting all 100 times with the last four times. And when I withdraw, she doesn't say anymore because we've learned this and we've processed, we want this in our marriage, but... I used to say it all the time when she would, she would say, you never want to talk about this. When the issue would come up, whatever the issue in the center is. For us, money was a big one. I grew up in a home. My family of origin is money is, 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 that you put away is called savings. In her family of origin, the savings is the difference between the actual price and the sale price. <laughs> Very different backgrounds. <laughs> and so we, our issue was money. And it would come up again, or I'd be reacting over something, finances in our home, and, and she, would, she would say, you never want to talk. I don't want to talk about it right now. That was my, right now. We can talk about it in an hour. No, I don't want to talk. That's really what, I don't want to ever talk about it. I'm done talking about it. That's my eye roll at the conversation with money. And she would say, well, you never want to talk about this. And, and here's what I'm thinking and feeling. I feel like we always talk about this. We never stop talking about this. We get nowhere with it. And that's why round and round it goes. And look at her other one is negative beliefs. Negative beliefs is assigning motives to another person's words or actions. Not really knowing what the intent is. So I love asking couples this question when they come into the office. I just had a, my last couple I worked with this week. You know, they're in there. They're, I'm mapping out their fear dance with them and trying to help them with it. And, and he says this. And when he says this, I know. And I just stopped and I asked, do you think it is in his heart to hurt you? Do you think he, wa do you think he got up this morning and said, I am going gonna, gonna to stick it to her? That may be how it's coming out because you both are reacting to each other. But do you think deep down that's what he wants for you to feel pain by something he says or does? You ask that and just pause with it for a little bit. There's a, and she said, no. I go, but, but that's what we do when we're in the moment. But see, on this side of the line, Amy is 100% responsible for her heart. And the best marriage on the planet are two people who have fired each other as a source of life. 
and they're plugged into the true and only source of life, and they spend their days giving each other the overflow. That's a great marriage. That's a great relationship. It's a great relationship with your kids. For those of you who are parents, if I can just encourage you, I think one of the biggest mistakes we make as parents is treating our children like children right up until the very day we expect them to be an adult. Parenting is a journey from control to influence. With every day of your child's life, you're losing control, but hopefully you're replacing it with influence. You all know, and many of you, if you went to college, you remember going to college and that freshman who just lost their mind? You're like, and it's probably because they grew up in a very controlling home where mom and dad controlled their every move. Now they showed up on college campus and they are not prepared. They don't know what to do. Talk this through with your teens because you have this going on with every single one. How many of you are raising teenagers? Let me just see your hands. Man, map it out. Maybe even before bringing it up to them, just map it out. What's really going on when this 15-year-old pushes my buttons? What's really going on when she's 18, wanting to go her own way and decide her own way? Listen, and if I can just encourage parents with all of this, we need to calm down a little bit. How many of you got young kids at home? Can I just see the hands of all young kids at home? It's getting out of control. I just, parents today are so stressed out in their relationships and the fear dance going on super early as mom and dad. Mom and dad, maybe this will help you as parents. If you work through your fear dance and honor one another, greater joy will come to you as parents. I remember when we were getting ready to have Corinne, you know, the big issue was formula at the time. You know, you don't give your baby formula, right? And I remember nursing didn't work for us. And I'll never forget the doctor telling us on Corinne's six-week visit, to Amy, ask her the question, good night, what are you doing, starving this baby? My wife started crying. We go to small group that night. Melody in our group, uh, an older lady who's wise, she heard the story. Amy and I were very emotional. She went into the kitchen, and she started mixing up a bottle. And I came in. I go, hey, what are you doing? She took that free formula they gave us from the hospital, and she started making a bottle. I go, hey, whoa, 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 what are you doing? She said, I'm making Corinne a bottle of formula. I said, oh, no, you're not. She said, why not? I go, well, first of all, I don't want her going to community college. That's why. I, <laughs> I, I've read that in the books. And, uh, but you know what? Corinne took that bottle and she slept all through the night. First time ever. We got up the next morning and looked at each other like, oh, she's dead. Nope, she wasn't. She was sleeping. And sure, she's not good at math. But <laughs> she's, she's nailing the other subjects. And we're proud of her, to be real honest with you. And then after that, I remember it was the binky. Remember the binky? Getting judged in public by parents with, oh, you're letting her use a binky. And Corinne used a binky till she was three years old. And sure, she can't pronounce her S's, but <laughs> she's nailed the other 25 letters, and we're proud of her for that. And then it became schools. What kind of school are you going to send your kids to? And then, oh, and then how about this one, the bus? I remember we, we put kids on the bus, and the parents are like, oh, you're not going to let her ride the bus. Yeah, how else is she going to learn about life? How many of you grew up riding the bus? Can I just see your hand? Now, I want to help all the young parents understand for just a second before you stress out about life. How many of you remember when the bus drivers had permission to kick off the bus unruly kids? Does anybody remember that? Look around the room. I grew up in the cornfields of Illinois. And I can't tell you how many times I walked a mile and a half home from the middle of the route through the cornfields, you'd see they're doing Ted through the cornfields. So long as you stayed out ahead of the combine, you were fine. <laughs> there were no parents standing on the road going, hey, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Listen, mom and dad, we stress over parents, parenting, parenting styles. If I can just go back to where we started with the word honor, esteeming each other is highly valuable. Caring for one another's hearts. I know Amy's buttons right now. I know she likes to be connected to. She processes life completely different than me. One way I honor her is by serving her, by caring for her, buttons, but with zero responsibility. I'm not responsible for her emotions, but I can care for them. This frees me up. It's with every one of your kids, coworkers, to just sit back and pause. How can I honor this person in the relationship? I don't want to push their buttons. I want to discover what they are and care for this person. And the last thing we're going to do before I'm out of here is I want you to connect to the true and only source of life. And the best way I know to do that is just to ask you to raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. (laughs) 
And in an election year, I have no idea what's going to happen to our country with comedians like you. Do hereby resign as general manager of the universe. I resign as general manager of my spouse, of my coworkers, friends, pastor, whoever else you need to name. And maybe if you're sitting next to somebody you know and love, just point to them right now. Let girls point to each other right now and just say these words. You're fired. You are not my source of life, and you will no longer suck the life out of me. May we care for one another. May we honor one another. Thank you, Plymouth Covenant, for allowing me to be a part of recharging and refocusing and reconnecting in your relationship. Love this church. I love the heart of this church. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Thank you so much. Man. You can give out. All right. Give out the last book. Yeah.